When I was much, 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 much younger than I am now, there used to be a candy counter at a Sears store. There aren't any Sears stores left. Um, uh, presumably even those that exist may no longer even have candy counters, but it used to be the highlight of any trip to the mall. We seem to park at the Sears parking lot and enter the mall through there. And so we would always pass it on uh, our way out headed home. And my mother would give my sister and I each 50 cents and we could buy 50 cents of any of the candies there, totally our choice. Those days, 50 cents worth of candy was a fair amount for a young child. And it was so exciting. It was the highlight uh, uh, of our visit. Uh, and uh, something I remember with great fondness and even enthusiasm to this day. I'm no longer quite as excited about the opportunity to get 50 cents worth of candy. And somehow I manage to spend a whole lot more at things I buy at stores today, but I'm not sure I greet any of them with the joyfulness I did back in those days. The enthusiasm that simple things can bring you when you are that age uh, is part of what I think Jesus is pointing us to in the text we've heard this morning. We're reminded um, of uh, this kind of enthusiasm and this kind of excitement as people are bringing little children to Jesus in the good news according to Mark that we've heard today. Um, the disciples seem to think that this was inappropriate um, not proper, perhaps, that uh, so many people would be coming to hear Jesus and learn from him and receive his word. And uh, presumably parents were uh, bringing their little children to him. And certainly those were not important enough uh, among all the people gathered there to uh, receive Jesus' immediate time and attention. So the disciples are rebuking those who would send children to be close to Jesus in this crowd. Jesus is indignant, the text tells us, indignant that his disciples would shoo little children away. And he says, those who do not receive the kingdom of God, just like these little children do, will never enter it. Those who do not receive the kingdom of God, like a little child, will never enter it. What might we need to do to receive the kingdom of God like a child that we might be able to enter into the kingdom of God? One of the things to think about as we approach this particular text is to remember that Jesus is on his way uh, to Jerusalem. And he's teaching along the way, and this is a, a section of extended teachings and interactions with the crowds who gather around Jesus. And the most immediate context for this particular exchange is uh, an effort by Pharisees to test and trap. Jesus. They, they uh, uh, approach him with what they think is a very savvy and maybe a trick question uh, about uh, divorce and remarriage, thinking they've really got him in a spot, right? They've analyzed what he had to say, and they've critiqued it, and they found a weak point, and they're going to go after it. And it's in the immediate aftermath of that in the immediate aftermath of that, that Jesus says, those who do not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Well, who was not receiving the kingdom of God like a little child? All of those who were looking for the weak point in Jesus' argument, all of those who were testing and uh, making an effort to trap him, all of those who were analyzing and um, critiquing the good news that Jesus offered as if they were, you know, professional critics. 
I sometimes go through life as if I'm a professional critic, analyzing and critiquing and evaluating everything left and right. I find that you know sort of particularly true in the, the, the hybrid moment that we live in now, not only hybrid worship is happening here at the church, but all of us are sort of living hybrid lives, you know, sort of trying to figure out what's safe to do and what's not safe to do. Sometimes it's tiring to have to figure out, yeah, I need to put the mask on um, or, or to decide maybe it's just not worth going out to do things. All of the, the analyzing and thinking we have to do, all of the evaluating that we have to do right now in order to um, move about the world safely, in some ways that turns us into uh, people who are full of skepticism, full of doubt, full of wondering and evaluating as if we're professional critics. Jesus brings the good news and others miss it, even though they're hearing him talk about it because they are overanalyzing and missing the joy and, and the hope in what he says. Jesus brings the good news and they end up missing the good stuff because of where their focus is. And we are at risk for doing all the same thing in, in all sorts of ways, I'd like to suggest. Um, as we approach the world with skepticism, uh, we risk becoming particularly caustic, particularly unimpressed with the world. We might even say that some days we're fairly blase about all that's happening, missing the good stuff because we do not view and approach our lives with a, an attitude of hopefulness and joy and enthusiasm. We allow ourselves to become professional cr critics, critiquing our own daily experiences. I think in this text this morning and in this instruction from Jesus, there is an opportunity and an invitation to move beyond the blase, to embrace that which is incomplete and imperfect. Yes, we have to make a lot of compromises. Yes, things aren't as they were. Yes, things are not as we would have them be if we were in charge of the universe. But the choice, whether to focus on what's not or to focus on what is, is entirely ours. We get to decide where we put our emphasis and, and, and where we put our energy. And, you know, focusing on those things that aren't as we would have them be that are incomplete and imperfect, that aren't quite yet where we would um, receive full measure of joy and excitement about them. Focusing on that can just take a lot of energy, take a lot of energy. So how might things be different for you as you move about the world? If you made an effort not to miss the good stuff. If, if you made a point of setting aside those thoughts that tend towards caustic, oh, oh. if you set aside those internal critiques that so often fill our heads and you decided to embrace the opportunities, the imperfect and incomplete and, and, and not exactly what you would have them be, but still opportunities that present themselves before you day in and day out. What if you rejoiced in what you can do rather than focused on what you can't? What if you moved beyond blasé? into a sense of, of excitement and enthusiasm and joy? What if you decided you would 
find and identify and name and speak to those things that might be signs of joy and hope and love and grace. How might that shift something for you? I think that's the the invitation um, in Jesus' instruction today to receive the kingdom of God like a little child. Finding excitement and joy and, and enthusiasm for little things, for small things, for imperfect things, for incomplete things in your life, in your days, in your relationships. There's probably somebody who on occasion makes you a little nuts now and then, somebody on occasion who uh, frustrates you now and then. You could focus on the things they do that are frustrating, or you could make a conscious choice to celebrate the things they do that are wonderful. That kind of application could be put into so many contexts. I trust that you will find one this week, some application by which you can move beyond the blase and into the joyful and enthusiastic. Wendell Berry puts it like this, be joyful though you have considered all the facts. You could give me a long list of facts and, and reasons and examples uh, for which being frustrated and caustic and, and cynical all makes perfect sense. Or you could choose to embrace the imperfect and the incomplete, move beyond the blase and become enthusiastic and joyful as a sign of Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.